so, so delighted that we have one of the artists in our exhibition here tonight, Daphne Arthur, to talk about her art. And Lise Curry is going to introduce her. Lise Curry is the woman we have to thank for this wonderful exhibition here, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall at St. Francis. Good evening, everyone. I'm standing here with pride to introduce Daphne Arthur, one of my favorite artists, and I'm proud to say that I have two of her works in my collection. And uh, she is really special because she does multidimensional uh, uh, art, and everything is so inventive and edgy, one of my favorite current works. And so I'm very proud to introduce her, and thank you so much for coming here. We're honored to have you, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. So I'm gonna, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna use the mic just cause I feel like my voice is not very loud. <laughs> and um, I wanted to thank Liz for the opportunity um, of being here and Jen for um, being so helpful and I'm a little bit nervous, so I'll, I'll, I'll warm up in a minute, <laughs> you know? Um, so um, when Liz um, emailed me to um, ask me if I would do an artist talk, I was really thrilled, and then I was like, wow, what am I gonna talk about? Because there's so many things that um, I, can, I can talk about, and, um, and I almost felt like um, I was sort of in a uh, crossroads and hopefully I take a path that is going to lead me uh, from the present all the way to the beginning. So when I speak I, and the way that I'm going to show my work is not in a chronological order, but everything at the end should make sense. Mm -hmm. So um, I wrote a little bit of um, <coughs> some notes and then I'm just going to read through that very quickly and then I'm just going to talk about the work. So uh, when I think about my work and the way that I wanted to kind of approach this is to kind of share with you the way that I perceive, uh, the way uh, I, I use a studio and try to kind of, the angle that I take for my practice. And part of it is sort of thinking about interconnectedness and artist experience. And I um, was trained as a painter, but um, I was always sort of interested in space and like how to sort of engage the viewer in the work. And eventually, the work became like a little bit um, like high relief, two dimensional, and. Um, but really, it was all in an effort to kind of create an experience. So, um, often there is high repulsion when fine art is brought into connection with common life. The life we share with all living creatures and nature. It is perceived as an affair of low appetite, lacking intellectual vigor, or at its best a thing of gross sensation, alluring to the senses in a lustful way. Um, the variety um, and perfection of the arts in Greece led thinkers to frame a generalized conception of art and to project the ideal of an art of organization of human activities such as the art of politics and morals that was conceived by Socrates and Plato. Um, so the ideas of design, plan, order, pattern, purpose, sort of emerge in distinction from the relation to the materials employed in their realization. The conception of man as a being that uses art became at once the ground 
of the distinction of man from the rest of nature, and at the same time, uh, the bond that ties him to nature. Um, so it is interesting to think about the senses as a pragmatic mechanism utilized to understand our environment and arrive in insight conscious meaning through the harmonious synchronization of the senses. The intervention of consciousness, therefore, adds regulation, power of selection, and predisposition, varying the arts without end, and in time leading to the idea of art as a conscious idea. The studio is a physical and mental space to unwrap, untangle, experiment, experience, scratch into, draw from, observe, transfer, transcribe, erase, transform, collapse, be silent, abandon past conceptions, and build relationships and connections with lived environments, um, expanding my understanding of human condition. This video is interesting as a starting point <coughs> because it's just a snippet of a short film that I've been developing. Um, and it kind of functions as a metaphor for the way you think about art through the poetics of nature, observation of time, rhythm of systolic and dysystolic patterns, and designs created by various elements like water, air, falling leaves, visual distortions created by the slowing down of light frequencies coming into contact with matter, water, particles, uh, the body traversing through space and time. And um, sort of the enigmatic appearance that yield surprising moments existing in cyclical uh, motions of harmony and chaos. <coughs> so, um, yet it also portrays a sense of entropy, not only because of chaos and unpredictability, but in the plethora of information that is not always readily accessible to the naked eye, but that is unrefutably there. So if you think about um, a tub of water, you, you can deduce some information. Uh, the height of the water, how much water there is in the top, so the relationship between the top and the water, and the temperature. But there's also like millions of organisms that are part of that water that you cannot see with your eyes, but that is there. So like sort of thinking about um, the limitations that we have, uh, just from our, the condition of being humans, but also thinking about um, how you can supersede that and how you can enhance your ways of observation to kind of think beyond uh, cultural limitations or what you know at the moment so to be kind of open and porous. And so the studio is a place where I kind of um, practice that. Um, so this piece is um, uh, all these works are kind of very new. Uh, they're created this year and uh, one of the main characters that keeps sort of emerging in my work is um, they're called the Escuderos. And the Escuderos are teenagers um, from Venezuela that have taken the kind of the forefront um, and they sort of become a physical shield um, protecting the protesters as they're marching, uh, you know, protesting against the regime. And I thought it was kind of interesting to think about them in a kind of philosophical way, in that they're young, you know, they're like maybe younger than I am. And so there's sort of an innocence. And at the same time, they exist in a paradoxical space of like ferocious, courageous energy. At the same time, I was interested in um, um, notions of uh, how through the materiality, they would kind of create um, their own mask to kind of protect themselves from uh, tear gas or from the water that the police like shoots at them. And there's a kind of like interesting 
invention that happens through the manipulation of thumb materials. And at the same time, uh, the, the kind of combination between trying to be anonymous and at the same time very individualistic, because they all kind of stand out. They're not uh, as uh, uniform as you would see uh, the, the military. And um, so these characters uh, really kind of emerging a lot in my work and uh, as a way to sort of pay homage to them. Uh, this piece is called Babata War. So one of the things that they would do is, uh, you know, like a Molotov war, a Molotov, but they would actually um, take a bottle and put feces and like basically throw that as their weapon. So really their only weapon is their bodies and like whatever they can um, think about to protect themselves. Um, but, uh, this is a detail. Um, it's a really long painting. Some of the works are inspired, obviously, uh, from the internet, I'm not present, but I do have a lot of family that's there, and uh, this situation has really affected us in direct and indirect ways. And, um, um, you know, I sort of think about how uh, history is sort of cyclical. So one of the things I think about is in 1948 to 1958, Venezuela was um, under dictatorship of Jimenez. And um, it's kind of ironic that there were three uh, main um, organizations that came together, uh, ADE, COPE, and the Union of uh, Republican Democratic, the Republic, the Union Republicana Dominicana, um, Democratica. So, but they came together um, to form a pact, uh, the Punto Fijo Pact. And it was basically to ensure that these organizations would sustain a sense of democracy. And that no matter what, there won't be a, a hegemony of one party to take over. And then, uh, now we kind of fast forward to 2019, and we're sort of in the same soup again. And uh, sort of thinking about um, sort of the recurrence of history to me is kind of interesting because, you know, you would think that, um, well, I, I was just thinking like in the time span of my grandmother was from Trinidad and she moved to Venezuela during the Jimenez dictatorship and now she's here, she's still alive. And, and sort of like within a short time span, we see ourselves in a very similar situation and how to kind of go beyond that or learn from our experience and uh, kind, of, kind of push beyond the cyclical aspects that, that kind of besieges, besieges us. Um, so uh, these pieces really are to pay homage to the individuals. Uh, this is a painting, uh, also one of the new paintings. Um, I, at some point, I started to kind of play with shaped canvases because I felt that um, this happened at the advent of uh, going to graduate school. I felt like um, I was, uh, my training, I would say is 30%. Western art, like this is how I uh, learned about art. But then 70% uh, makes up my uh, relationship to being Venezuelan and being from Trinidad and sort of learning about different cultures and different artists. And I felt that when I was working within the paradigm of the rectangle, it was sort of conjuring a history that I wasn't really part of, like I was always excluded from. And um, I began to um, deconstruct a little bit the square of the canvas. So, you know, when we think about a painting or a square, you think about the window to something. Um, but I was kind of interested in, like, creating a, sort of a jarring effect, something that sort of pushed through that's not confined um, to a, a particular norm. So um, this piece is uh, some of the works uh, created by taking uh, pictures of my own uh, or also uh, combining with found images and 
And this is kind of just uh, one of those homage to those pieces. Here you can see um, how the escuderos are really uh, shielding the protesters and and the police. So, you know, there was a there was an image that was really striking for me, and um, it was this guy that he came out and he was naked, and he just came up with the Bible and he was like. I have nothing to lose. And this is kind of like desperation that we see in like many parts of the world, and like in Chile, in Hong Kong. It's like, it's like everywhere. And um, it's just kind of interesting to kind of think about those power dynamics. Um, so another thing that happens in the studio is I take on a kind of performative role. And um, this happened recently. I started to kind of think about the mask, and I created my own kind of uh, mask. Um, <laughs> and in the studio, what I did from watching so many uh, videos, I started to kind of reenact some of the gestures and kind of uh, just do a video to see how it would feel to be in that position. Um, one thing that I, I realized, uh, which was surprising to me, is sort of how as I wore the mask, it's some, how I had to kind of give myself uh, permission to kind of exist. Um, and what I'm saying is that like life is performance. I remember Tanya Burguera once was like, life is performance and performance is art. And she's totally right. It's like um, what I'm doing right now is a performance. Like when I'm talking to anybody, it's like, you know, and it's almost like you change depending on who you're speaking to. So the act of kind of shielding that, um, it's kind of confrontational even to your own self. Um, and uh, um, allowing yourself to just be genderless, sort of exist in a kind of fluid manner, was kind of interesting. Um, so these works, um, this, pain, this painting is called Flight. Um, and here the work is um, using different motifs, just aspects of topology. So sometimes when I think about the work, I, I think of, uh, about when you're experiencing a piece, it's almost like you're experiencing lightning. You're just experiencing the climax of uh, multiple uh, moments and events that kind of clashes together to have that, that one. Uh, a climactic moment. And sort of thinking about sort of um, um, data and information that may not be as easily recognizable. So the piece in the, for the elements in the foreground, like the vine shape characteristics, is a new motif that started emerging to the work. And sort of thinking about ideas of barriers. So in Venezuela, we have a lot of fences. You know, fence. You're fencing off the wall, the windows. And when I first came to the U.S., when I was, uh, I don't know, eight or something like that, um, I ended up. Um, I was really fascinated by the fact that there's no fence anywhere. Everything is like kind of open. And. Um, in addition to that, I was really privileged to go to um, the Amazon, and in one of those expeditions, I saw how in nature, in order to kind of protect themselves from other um, invasive uh, uh, organisms, they, everything had um, spikes. So the paintings are uh, the lighter blue areas are made of oil paint and when it dries it creates an interesting kind of textural quality but it's really resisting and uh, it was really interesting in the idea of creating paint that has a sense of space where you can sort of um, sort of think about like entering to this world but at the same time the, the paint is sort of pushing pushing back um, and that idea really came from this painting. So this was like the second painting that I did. This is called uh, The Rebel Wears Prada. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke. But um, part of the idea of the title is um, thinking about who really starts sometimes the, the descent. 
And so, uh, again, thinking about Venezuela, um, when Chavez came into power, uh, a lot of the middle class and upper class did not um, go along with it. They were staunch opposers. And eventually, um, other sectors of the society have been joining in to fight um, sort of the repression. But um, sort of that, that was kind of like the play on the title. The, the title sometimes is almost like that entropic quality. It's, uh, it gives a clue as to perhaps what I'm thinking about. Um, but the idea of creating the textural qualities of the previous piece came from this. And the, the work in the studio is really fluid. This was actually a painting of my grandmother that I worked on for like a year. And I created like these uh, textural things on it and I just messed it up. I really, there was no return to the painting. So I ended up uh, spray painting uh, with orange and was really fascinated by the uh, marks that were left behind. Almost as thinking about spolia in, uh, when you go to Rome and you see the levels of, of strata, like how they're building upon, upon each other. And there's like a level of history that kind of is imbued in there. And again, I'm thinking about how pain can sort of transfer to notions of skin. Um, so another part of the project, uh, a way that I work is really through drawing. Um, I, create, I started creating these Portraits. This is uh, Angela Davis, and uh, it's watercolor and Albana ink. Albana ink is from Japan. It's made out of a spider root flower, and it, they use it to um, create the designs of the kimono patterns. And what is kind of cool about it is when you add water, it sort of disappears. So I had a student, and she's like, "Oh, you should try this." And I tried it, and it was like amazing because it creates like it's a I like ideas of unpredictability. So whenever you add water to it, you really don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I was interested in thinking about political prisoners, and so I started researching. And as I was researching, I amassed a list of 106 uh, individuals that have been uh, set to prisons. Um, and in the process of it, sort of reading about their history. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Sekulo Denga. Um, and as I was reading about it, uh, I was realizing how a lot of these individuals were placed in solitary cell confinement. And so I began to think about space um, and sort of thinking about um, what it would be like to be in a, in a eight by six by eight space for 42 years, like um, Alfred Fox was. And he was recently released in 2006 or 2007 recently. But so um, this is a picture in my studio. And sort of, I'm, I'm thinking about drawing still, right? But drawing in space. So I, I use what's readily, readily accessible. I had painter's tape, and I basically just started demarcating the area. And then as I'm reading about these individuals, I started to think about uh, the places that they were confined for so many years, and began to create like a map of the floor plan, of the aerial view of these prisons. So some of them is like the, part of it is a Rikers Island, Part of it is the Mohenei State Penitentiary. Another part is like Angola prison. And they're sort of creating a mesh, almost like a map, but a mesh of architectural and uh, sort of designs of urban planning that really dictates how you live through space. Like even if I'm thinking about this institution, somebody has designed it to be like how you can navigate it or even engage with other people. And so um, those are the ways that I think in the studio. This is um, called uh, uh, critical evaluation. 
And um, again, I put myself in the position of, I become sort of the subject. And I began to kind of, um, I made a sculpture of myself using tape. So I would tape and then use um, plastic wrap to kind of get the structure. And on top of that, I added plaster because I was sort of interested in sort of using the material that was malleable um, to sort of represent the body. So this piece in, in essence at some point it will just kind of disappear and decay. And, but there's like an element of hope in, in that the light sh that shines through it sort of um, gives a, a hopeful meaning for it. But it also it was a piece that was really important for me because it was the moment in which I finally felt released from the wall. Like I was making sculptures or assemblages, but everything was stuck to the wall. Mm -hmm. And this is like the first time that it became like free. And so it's almost like the metaphor of the, there's like a, like a picture frame in the back of the figure really emerging from, from the dimensional space. Um, this piece is called Phantom Dynasties. It, um, I created this piece sort of um, thinking about a certain relation to like the Trayvon Martin and uh, just the ideas of like how black bodies uh, can navigate certain spaces or also the um, spectacle in which they're, they're shone light into. And part of it was uh, thinking about what it is to always be in disaster of resignation. Um, um, and so what are those things that, how does it affect the psychology of, of that body? In addition to that, I was thinking about, I did the portrait and I was like, wow, it looks like Thomas Sankara. He was like the prime minister of uh, Burkina Faso, who was murdered. Um, because he was, uh, he was too um, revolutionary um, and he wanted to kind of push the politics of Burkina Faso or sort of become independent with a francophone uh, country and he, he wanted a kind of independence that was really uh, too much for certain countries to handle. Um, so I was sort of thinking about this idea of suppression and like how, how can we emerge from that. Um, this piece was kind of fun too because again when I'm making work I'm thinking about layering and um, as the previous piece, uh, The Rebel Wears Prada, I'm not fixed to anything at the moment. So like I make creative work and then <clears throat> it does not work well. I have no problem going over it and like, doing something to it because I feel like all the gestures eventually accumulate just to the ultimate meaning of what the work is. This was fun because I was able to throw paint at the paint at the piece and sort of create a different dyna dynamics um, so that the work can sort of like have a slow read and a fast read. And so sort of thinking about those optical um, mechanisms in which I can engage the viewer or myself in these works. So now we're back to 2010, which is part of the piece that's in this exhibition. And this piece is, uh, this body of work is kind of important. I did it right after uh, graduate school. And I was sort of thinking about sort of limiting my palette or materials and seeing what can happen. And so collage became a really important element. Um, part of this piece is, is inspired by a trip that I did. I, I visited my father in uh, Venezuela and uh, uh, very much estranged from that part of the family. But I stayed there for I don't know, a week, two weeks. And um, my half siblings and cousins, like everybody was just talking about hair all the time. And like that, that was the only conversation we could have. <laughs> and it was like a little bit baffling because um, within that part of the family is very mixed. So as is most Venezuelans, you have Afro influence, Andean and European. 
but the efforts to erase part of the black heritage is so endemic in the culture, like like um, even the way people uh, categorize themselves, mulato, mulato, based on like the way you look, the way your hair, the texture of your hair. Um, was uh, kind of interesting to think about um, not only the social dynamics within a family, but to kind of think about the way you create your own sense of identity. And part of it, I was sort of thinking about um, uh, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, and that the character can never come to terms with who she is. Like she always wants to be what she's not. And uh, the response was kind of towards that. But another thing that became, so like the main thing in these pieces are sort of the hair, right? It's like the only thing that's like the kind of focal standard. And then the, the figures are sort of abstract. They're sort of grotesque. They're made up, they're in, unrecognizable. But a really kind of cool thing that happened uh, from the development of this project was that I started to burn the paper. So this is the first uh, attempt at burning. Uh, and it's important because since then, I've developed a technique of <coughs> doing smoke drawings where I take a candle and I raise uh, the paper above my head and basically I start to, I don't burn the paper, but I just allow the soot of the paper to create a film. And then I use different tools, either erasing or have different tools that I make to kind of etch into the drawings, to pull out the form. But the kind of interesting um, aspect of this process is like completely um, spontaneous, it's completely, there's an element of chance because you're working with something that's amorphous. You're not, you can't control how the flame uh, touches the paper. Um, and also, another element of it that's really interesting to me is the process of erasure. So I sometimes think about this as like additive and subtractive, but really most of it is subtractive. So I'm erasing literally with an eraser or other tools. And also in the process of burning again is another process of erasure. And, uh, and this kind of building of um, layering, it becomes so like beautiful. I, I can't stop doing it, really. Um, so this is, um, the piece is, in, is I live in Far Rockaway by the beach, and so it's inspired by that landscape living in the coast. Um, I made this piece when I went to uh, Mass Malka for residency, and I, through a friend, I met this musician, her name is Alida, she's fantastic, she's a lead singer of Le Petit Pepinot, and um, she allowed me to her house to take a picture of her. So um, part of it is from the picture I took, but the background is a made up space. And when I created this piece, it was kind of fun because I, I was introduced to the Kronos for the first time. And so I went to a Kronos concert and like experienced the music and you can feel it from your foot all the way through. And um, I was sort of like thinking about how to create rhythm in the work. And uh, also, uh, this process of working allows me to think about light. So for maybe like seven years, I just worked in smoke drawings without color. Um, or without using painting, really. And so the background here, the, the light that's coming through the window, this created by, um, there was like a shrub of berries that was like across from the dormitories. And I waited until night time to go and like cut some like berries and went back to the studio and with like a spatula, like started like hammering it to, into, um, into, the paint, into the paper. And sort of like the idea of like using material that's organic. So the smoke drawing, the, the, payment from 
the berries or even the albina ink. I really think about using materials that are not completely synthetic that are in the environment or that you can say they have like a primordial kind of quality to it. Um, this is a detail. Uh, this is a recent painting, it's called Usumbara Boys. They're um, Samba Boys from the Usumbara Mountains in Tanzania. And I, I was there in the summer and I took a lot of photos and sort of very new work. But I'm in the process of kind of creating uh, and developing the smoke drawings where I can um, have more of a tactile kind of quality. So sort of really thinking about pulling out the forms and also having uh, a sense of space in which I'm creating more atmospheric feeling uh, so that I can really start to push and uh, push and pull that of space. Um, this piece is called Appearance of the Lotus Jewel and it took about three years to make, about, probably more. But uh, it came, it came with a dream. I had a dream. Um, I was like hovering over the water. It was like nighttime, and um, I'm seeing all these orbs of light kind of emerging from the water, and eventually they blossomed into lotus flowers. And it was fantastic. Um, and then I, I left it. And about a year after, I was reading the Lotus Sutra, and I was like. This is describing my dream. It was so weird. So then I started to be like, okay, maybe I should do something about this. And um, I decided to make a thousand mm -hmm. flowers. So you probably know about the, the thousand cranes. You, um, so um, if you uh, give away a thousand cranes, you can make a wish. And so there's kind of like this sense of utopia and uh, sort of idealistic utopia embedded in, in the concept of the work. But also, um, I was interested in creating a work of art that was kind of accessible to the public, so that you can actually interact, walk through the piece, and take a flower and go home. Um, and in the process of sort of conceptualizing this work, I, I was talking to some friends, and they're like, well, you know, maybe the viewers should be, uh, have some sense of responsibility. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, maybe like you're taking part of the piece and it's like the shape of the world map and like you interconnect it with the world, you know, like what is your connection with not only the art, but like where are you taking it from? You're really taking something that is rep representing nature. Uh, so when I think about flowers, I think about it's a, a symbol of hope. No matter what we do to the earth, it just keeps coming back. And um, it's, it's a symbol of love too. And so for me, this piece has been like the most um, illuminating because it was really a labor of love. Um, there was a lot of investment, and but um, I, I, I also felt like there's aspects of vulnerability. Um, I was talking about ephemer ephemerality, transformation. Um, as people take flowers, um, the, the work of art is transforming. So I had people from Finland, this was in, a, was in an exhibition in Finland called Radical Relevances, and there were people from all over the world, Spain, Brussels, and so basically how the work can sort of transform beyond the confines of my organization, the way that I'm envisioning. And sort of uh, in that process, sort of influencing and like taking on a life of its own. Uh, so then I had flowers left. I kind of give I gave out like four four hundred flowers <coughs> in Finland. So I had six hundred flowers left, and I was like, I should do this again. So in August, uh, the summer passed. I decided to do. Uh, this project again, but then I felt like maybe I can I change the shape up a little bit to kind of emulate the space. So I did it in Far Rockaway at the beach, beach 73, and uh, again invited people over to interact with the pieces. 
And their response was really beautiful. And so I was, um, some of the things that I'm thinking about is sort of a platonic ideal of art. Um, how, do we, how do you make art that's accessible? So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the art world and uh, there's sort of niches that happens in, in that society. But like, how do you make it accessible to the guy walking down the street or the kid that's running around and sort of kind of engage in a way that's a little bit more profound, like more intimate? Um, so I'm going to show you just a little video of the feeling of the happening. <laughs> Translate your 
Do you have like so many thoughts on how the world is, like your perceptions on interactions, and like I guess I'm wondering what sparks that, or like how you translate that and find the mediums that you want to represent those interactions and like your feelings on that. Yeah. So um, I think everything always starts. This is running. Yeah. I think everything always starts with drawing and um, also kind of thinking about like how different mediums allude to different histories and how we connect to them. So for me like painting feels like uh, storytelling or something like I'm dealing with colors like different uh, techniques that sort of kind of like a historical connotation, like our historical connotation, but I try to create my twist with it. And then also, like for example, the piece of the political prisoners. Um, so it's, it, sometimes it starts with the research, then it starts with the drawing, but then sort of thinking a little bit more abstractly. And, and so taking, my mom says, getting rid of the fat, and getting to the lean part of the meat. And so for me, the process, all the process is like that. So sometimes I start with painting or drawing or sculpture, and then eventually, how do I get to the more succinct? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, how do I get to the more succinct uh, interpretation of that idea? So just kind of being open. So like, I, I don't consider myself a painter, I don't consider myself a sculptor, but like kind of using uh, things in my surrounding to be able to express a notion that, that, that feels that is more related to the idea and a depiction of it through a painting. Uh, how has your experience been in interact or in um, seeing people interact with your flower piece? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it's cool because um, you know you spend like so many hours like making these things, so laborious, and then it's beautiful to see somebody like taking it and, and looking and flipping and admiring and and then. Uh, Taking, taking it with them. Um, one of the interesting acts, aspects I thought was uh, how it kind of conjure up memories. And so some people would be like, this reminds me, there's a lady that took something that looked like a succulent. So some of the pieces are, are in, inspired by nature, but others are kind of I make it, made it up. And they would be like, this lady took a piece that looked like a succulent, and she's like, this reminds me of, a, I once had a horse, and I, I rode the horse to my aunt's house, and it was eating the flowers. <laughs> and, like, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. I was sort of like, it starts to kind of um, go beyond um, how I can think the work would have an effect on the person, and be able to kind of share that with them. And then it's just, it's just nice to give a token. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering what triggered you uh, coming to do these portraits, real life portraits. Yeah. Because it's, uh, I find it so unusual that you're doing this uh, alongside, maybe not alongside, but uh, sort of just after you've done something very different. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I'm, in, I'm engaged in the world and I think, I, I think about how other people are engaged in the world and try to make a difference and then how, because uh, it's almost like they're, they're working against the grain and then they, uh, unfortunately <coughs> succumb or they're put away or silenced. And, um, so one thing that I, like, I think about, for example, is that uh, I think about like the move, movement in Philadelphia uh, where these people were bombed out of their neighborhood. 
And so I think about history. For me, history is like really important um, in relation to the work. So sometimes the work is kind of like allegorical, biographical, but somehow it has some some thread in like what's happening in the now or like. Um, so the piece with uh, Angela Davis, it really kind of comes from an, an idea of like, we are in a world where we have this idea of like uh, the mass incarceration. Um, I was uh, doing some volunteering with uh, Literacy for Incarcerated Teens and um, going to Rikers Island and visiting uh, these young kids that are there and like, really sensing how detached, they're so detached from ev everything that's happening. And, the, and like nobody really understands what's happening to them or like they don't care. It's like out of sight, out of mind type of thing. And sort of, under sort of understanding kind of like other parts of society that are kind of marginalized or forgotten about. Or, and so the work kind of emerges from like kind of being conscious about that. Um, there's a kind of interesting story. So sometimes, uh, and then I don't know, like divine intervention, I don't know. I mean like sometimes I was doing the portrait of Sukho Odinga, and uh, I was doing this guy's portrait, it was a Tuesday. And I was, I was teaching at the time at a Ashton studio in Manhattan. And I'm walking down, uh, Penn Station, and you know Penn Station is crazy, right? There's like a lot of people. I'm walking down, and my eyes just zooms in into this guy, and I, I was like, wow, he looks just like Sakura Dinga. So I walk by, and I'm like, hey, are you Sakura Dinga? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, shut. <laughs> I was, I mean, I started crying because I was like, just confronted with his history. Like he was one of the Panther from one. He was in jail for like over three decades. So at first I was like in shock. And then like just being confronted with the history of this individual was like so like overwhelming. So so I think part of that is, I have to say maybe part of divine intervention because who, who would think that this would happen, you know? So. They inspired you to do this book. Yeah. Well, I did the drawing and then I met him <laughs> in Penn Station. Oh, it's the other way around. You have done the, the I, portrait. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess you're right. Divine intervention. Yeah. Would you say you are a visual artist commentating on life in, in, from your own point of view? Yeah. And that would be a source, a great source of your your work, whether it demands a uh, dimensional type or a sculpture and so on. Yeah. So, um, so at the beginning, I was talking about like the synchronization of the senses. So, like, kind of um, in order to understand your condition as a human in relationship to your environment. So understanding how, what it feels like to touch or to smell or, or even like ideas of memory sort of starts to conjure up all those elements. And so really all of it is through my perspective to like either something that I've lived through or like I'm researching and embedding myself into it. And um, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's especially when you had that the visual of the person in the water and the shot was going up and you could literally see the outlines of clouds and the sun. Yeah. I shoot the sun and clouds quite often and I'm focused east mm -hmm. on a very large window. And to have seen that from your point of view as a visual artist commentating on the, as you say, senses and, and so on. I'm like, wow, my my photos are similar, but without the water. So you yeah. have, 
use a perception um, vehicle of under the water and shooting up. It's like, wow, that's a very interesting, yeah. captivating point of view. Yeah, trying to like, so like we're so we're conditioned to experience the world like this. Mm -hmm. This is how we experience. And so for me, I had like a GoPro and like kind of taking it and like putting it in different perspectives so that I can actually have a different experience of like existence. And that was, that was fun because I put it in the pool and <laughs> so part of it is like play and like experimentation, but like in order to kind of achieve a new perspective that I haven't experienced. So would you say you're fearless? <laughs> no, I have a lot of fear, but I, I, I uh, started longboarding about two or three years ago, and it was like amazing because um, part of the thrill of longboarding is going downhills. Oh, and my mom is here, but so I love going down hills and I love speed. But part of it is um, you you have a sense of trepidation because you're doing something that your body is telling you not to do, right? But the cool aspect of it is to like to you have a sense of being grounded and like being in the present, and that allows you to kind of like maneuver. If you fear too much, then most of the chances is like you're gonna start quivering and you fall down. So I have a lot of fear, but maybe it's like trying to like be in the moment and then seizing that experience and seeing what can happen from that. Oh. Uh, so I have a very general question. Um, my question is, I just want to get your opinion on the main thing. Uh, I've, listened, I've, I've listened to some of the questions, all the questions that come up for me, and um, it all like ties into my question to you. So I see that you use a lot of uh, life and nature and living organisms in your paintings and in your works, and you travel a lot. You go travel a lot of places and use a lot of different styles in your paintings and your paintings take a lot of time, your work takes a lot of time to develop. And so my question to you is, uh, based on what we see in the world today, uh, what do you think about humans and humankind and life in general today, where we are, and with all the uh, addition of all the mechanics and the non-life essential being added into our daily lives. What do you think about that? <laughs> and in relation to your art and where that will take us in the future. So um, I think about interconnectedness. When I think about that, I think about um, I think about how we cannot exist without one another. I think about um, aspects of like, um, I think about how we uh, interconnected through breath, so that how like three billion years ago, there was no oxygen, mostly nitrogen and carbon dioxide. And then maybe two and a half billion years, there were these um, uh, single cell organisms called cyanobacteria. And they have the capability of um, photosynthesis. So taking energy from the sun and turning carbon dioxide into oxygen. And because they existed so many billions and millions of years ago, today I can take a deep breath and like everybody else here can take a deep breath. So part of it I think that um, we can only experience in a very myopic way life, but that um, things that are happening would lead to other things that we cannot have phantom what, what the results would be. 
Um, in terms of technology, awesome. You know, like, what would I do without my computer or without um, the ability to um, Google anything that I want? And so, like, um, for me, it's sort of like all, you can use these things in a like negative way, but then you can also use it in a way that would enhance your conception of life and perhaps other people's lives. Okay, and uh, I saw in your art you use a lot of, uh, again, in the times that we are now, mm -hmm. you use a lot of the political issues, a lot yeah. of the social unrest. Social unrest. And yeah. being from the Caribbean, Venezuela, I'm from the Caribbean as well, there's a lot of that going along, yeah. going, on, going on throughout the world. Yeah. You know? I mean, I feel like art should sort of reflect. If I was making art that looks like the Renaissance, and like it would be strange, you know. Like art should reflect your the artist or your experience at the moment, and also materials. It should it should reflect where you're living at that point in time. So, um, yeah, talking about like these issues of like um, mass incarceration or riots happening in Venezuela and unrest is is something that I'm, I'm living in right now. And so um, part of the studio is being able to kind of take what's happening in my surroundings and kind of distill it in that space, it's both a physical and mental space, to kind of unravel and think about like, what is, like, how, how, what is my contingency in that, in that situation? And how do I react to it? How do I think about it? How do I engage with, my students or like the person who walk, you know, it's just like aware of a way of becoming aware and conscious of uh, my present. Daphne, thank you. That was fabulous. Thank you.